Oh, the weather outside is frightful, and so are the programs that you'll find on Topic, the streaming service for true crime fans. And sure, you're thinking, Alicia, I have a ton of streaming services already. Yeah, but do any of them offer you nothing but true crime stories from around the world like Topic does? Their high-quality international stories are unique and intriguing, so you aren't going to be finding the same cases you've heard over and over. Topic offers scripted shows and docu-series all inspired by real events. In my queue, the Sundance selection The Dark Heart, about a young investigator who loses herself in the case based on the Swedish bestseller. And then there's The Missing Children. This is the story of how almost 800 children and babies' bodies were discovered on the grounds of a home for unwed mothers. As one woman said, they now had a mass grave in the west of Ireland, and the nuns are involved. Be warned, this story is not only horrifying, but will have your blood boiling. Topic is the streaming service you need if you're a true crime head. Entertain your dark side. This holiday season, get all of this content for 50% off a yearly subscription. That's only $2.49 per month for the whole year. Use code HOLIDAY22 for 50% off. That's HOLIDAY and the number 22 for a year of streaming for just $29.99. This is Murder in the Rain, where each week Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough tell true crime stories of the Pacific Northwest. Murder in the Rain contains graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. Harvey Kerrigan was born in Fargo, Minnesota on May 18, 1927, to a young, single mother. As a child, he was anxious and a chronic bedwetter whose face would twitch during times of stress. He was raised Roman Catholic and had an imaginary friend named Paul. His mother was not interested in mothering and for years tried to pawn the boy off on relatives and attempted unsuccessfully to sign him over to an orphanage. At 11 years old, Harvey's mother dropped him at Mandan Reform School in North Dakota, which he described as a little prison for children. Kerrigan alleges abuse by the female guards tasked with hurting these young wards. He claims they doled out punishment by smothering those with infractions against their breasts and stomachs. He claimed these things, as well as sexual abuse from both a female family member and a babysitter. And though they were never proven, Harvey believed these claims to be true, and they fueled his hatred of women. As a boy, he was thin, undersized, and bullied by older boys at Mandan. But as a man, he stood six foot two and weighed nearly 200 pounds. The now 18-year-old Harvey needed enforced structure to maintain his own stability, so he walked into a U.S. Army recruitment office to join the Green Boys. He would later be transferred to Fort Richardson in Anchorage, Alaska, where in 1949, he would kill Laura Showalter and attempt to rape and murder Dorcas Callan. She reported the attack immediately, and Harvey was scooped up easily by police due to his hardened, super-identifiable face and hulking stature. Harvey had escaped a hanging death for Laura Showalter's murder on a technicality. His rights against self-incrimination had been violated after his arrest for the attack on Dorcas Callan. He spent time in Alcatraz after his sentence was commuted, afterwards shifting between time in prison and living on the outside in almost equal measure. Kerrigan left Seattle on June 19, 1973, in his light yellow Chevy pickup, after detectives Bauman and Homan had his Oldsmobile towed away to be processed. He'd almost thrown down with them that evening, but backed off when Detective Billy Bauman unholstered his service revolver. He eventually made his way to Minnesota, but before that, Harvey headed south. This is known because Harvey received a speeding ticket the next day in Solano County, California, the Bay Area which would make him a suspect in a series of murders, which we'll discuss at the end of the episode. June 28, 1973, in Minneapolis, Marilis Townsend was attacked and abducted while waiting for a bus on an empty street. In her memory, there was the sound of a shoe scraping on the sidewalk behind her and then a tremendous blow to the back of her head, rendering her unconscious. 
Marilis woke to pain and found herself in a pickup truck driven by a, quote, huge balding man who grabbed her hand to make Marilis touch his genitals. She pulled away and scrambled for the door handle, unlatching it. The man grabbed Marilis by the hair, but she was able to pull away and run away because her attacker had only snagged the wig she'd been wearing. She told the police the truck had a silver canopy on its top. September 9, 1973, Jerry Billings, 13, was hitchhiking in Minneapolis when a truck pulled over and led her into the cab. Jerry gave the man her destination, and as they drove, she could see they were heading in the wrong direction. When Jerry asked to be let out, the man drove on and pulled out his penis, wrestled her over to his side of the truck, and forced her to perform oral sex on him while he raped her vaginally with the handle end of a claw hammer. When Jerry tried to raise her head, the man struck her with the hammer and, quote, her head seemed to explode and she saw flashing lights. Was there any, not that someone needs an explanation, but I'm just curious why a 13-year-old was hitchhiking? Like, was she a runaway or was she houseless on the street? She, she had run away and it wasn't specific, but she felt she couldn't go home, I imagine. Wow. That there was abuse, yeah. something awful there. Um, yeah, so she... Oof, that's so scary. 13, my God. Still conscious, she made herself as small as possible in the seat and tried not to cry because it enraged him. They drove a while longer before the man pulled into a cornfield and stopped the truck. He picked Jerry up, threw her down in the field, and attempted to rape her anally. But he couldn't maintain an erection and again raped her orally. After he ejaculated, the man let Jerry dress and drove her to Crystal, a suburb that borders Minneapolis, where he warned the girl not to tell anyone before letting her out and speeding away. It won't surprise you to hear the truck had a silver canopy. Do you, and I'm sorry to spring this on you, do you happen to know what the technicality was that allowed him out of prison when he was on death row? So he was brought in originally when he was arrested. He was charged with a crime and housed. And then I think the next day he was brought to the U.S. Marshal Herring to be interviewed about the uh, murder, I believe. Mm-hmm. But he hadn't been in front of a judge about that crime yet. Uh, so by the time, it, yeah, so he was convicted and everything, and then it got to the uh, Supreme Court. And it, I mean, and it was unfortunately, the it was a clear violation of, I think, of what was called the, uh, uh, and I don't know if it still is, the McNabb rule, right, which protected them against that. Right. And yeah. Not that I think he should have been on, the, on death row, because I don't believe in the death penalty, but again, just hearing this 13-year-old being attacked with a hammer when he still should have been behind bars. But the cops didn't do the right thing. Anyway. It was Alaska, you know, frontier territory. Yeah. They just kind of play it loose. <laughs> Rules schmools. You saw the gray. <laughs> it's nuts up there. <laughs> Jerry did not report the crime until late October, the 29th. She had run away from home and had no one to whom she could turn. So she balled it up and stuffed the truth in that secret place where trauma lives to smolder until she could not hold it anymore. Jerry filed the report with the Goodhue County Sheriff's Office in Red Wing, Minnesota, home to a juvenile correctional facility, Red Wing Training School, where Jerry had been sent. That was rife with the same types of abuse Harvey Kerrigan claimed he suffered while at a North Dakota reform school as a boy. I found articles regarding abuse allegations at Red Wing ranging from the years 1911 to 1988 to 2011 to 2016. So they've been doing things about it, huh? They've cleaned up their act. They're not letting just staff anybody come get this stuff. Film done. film juveniles sex <gasps> images. <sighs> they don't do that. It's just unbelievable how every facility in every town, in every state. Every authority, anything. Every system is rife with pedophiles. Thank you. Harvey met Eileen Hunley, 28, in January of 1974, after her car broke down ahead of him in traffic. After Harvey tried, but couldn't get the car running, he offered Eileen and her two church friends a ride home, which they accepted. Earlier that month, Harvey had traded in his pickup for a 1971 green Chevy Caprice with black interior, which fit Harvey and the three women with room to spare. 
Eileen lived in Anoka, a suburb 30 miles north of Minneapolis. A member of The Way Fundamentalist Church, she was originally from Kansas and worked at a daycare center. The two began an official couple relationship that May. Eileen knew nothing of his criminal past. She started dating the man that picked her up while she was hitchhiking? No, she, was in, she wasn't hitchhiking. They were just like in traffic. Oh, the car. Yeah, her it car broke, died. Yeah. But st- well. I mean, he, was, he, he presented a good front yeah, yeah. by being handy. And helpful. Helpful and, yeah. and generous with his time. I mean, that's it, true. It, but, I... but it kind of a classic, maybe like over, like a love, like not a love yeah, bomb, yeah, but yeah. sort of like a prowess Just bomb. Just masking. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, prowess bomb. I like that. Thank you. A body was found in Olathe, Kansas on June 19th, 1974. It was later discovered that Harvey and Eileen were staying at a family home 80 miles away from where the body was found. That weekend, he left the home several times for unexplained reasons and was away for hours each time. In July, the relationship between Eileen and Harvey went bad. Harvey had started drinking heavily, which stoked his temper. He would become enraged any time she voiced her worries. Eileen broke it off with Harvey, saying she hoped they would maintain a friendship. She was seen in her home on Saturday, August 10th, but she failed to attend church, work, and a prayer meeting the next day. None of her family or friends heard a thing from her. The same day, or shortly after, Eileen's co-workers were creeped out and alarmed when Harvey dropped by to collect her paycheck. They refused his request, even though he said Eileen had sent him as she was indisposed. Just the idea of because because she was with friends, she probably wasn't a victim the first time they met. Like that might have been the only reason why was because she had the two ladies with her. I never thought about that. Absolutely. Yeah. And then he's like, "Eh, yeah, might as well have a girlfriend for a while. Yeah, was, yeah. Oh, we're breaking up. I'm done. My gosh. And that's, I feel like that's kind of unusual too, because people tend to keep the facade, or people, serial killers tend to keep the facade of here's my happy, normal family. Here's my girlfriend or my wife. And they are off limits and everyone else is the target. So I feel like you don't often hear someone being like, well, and then the girlfriend dumped me. So. Harvey's control over his impulses seems to have left him in the wake of Eileen's disappearance. On September 8th, friends Lisa King, 16, and June Lynch, who would turn 17 the next day, were hitchhiking outside of the alternative school they attended, the Work Opportunity Center, and soon climbed into the green Chevy Caprice that pulled over for them. The driver was over 40 and balding and had a face like a rough sculpture of a ghoul. It was Harvey and he offered the girls 25 bucks to help him gas up and drive a stalled-out car of his back to Minneapolis from Mora, 70 miles north. Leary, yet piqued by the offer of cash, they agreed. But before they reached Mora, Harvey turned off the highway into a wooded area where he stopped the truck, grabbed a gas can, a screwdriver, and a hammer, and had June follow him into the trees. June had just begun weighing the plausibility of it being a reasonable spot for a truck to be parked, when Harvey spun toward her with something raised in his fist. Lisa heard June scream from the truck and ran in the direction she'd seen the pair walk. She found June on the ground with blood pouring from her head. Harvey was gone. Lisa ran for help and found some at a nearby farmhouse. A deputy sheriff soon arrived and rushed the teenagers to a hospital where ER staff found seven hammer strikes on June's head. She survived and recovered from her wounds and a severe concussion through weeks of dizzy spells and headaches. There's something extra disturbing about the fact that he is like, um, that he's utilizing his knowledge of human psychology from his experiences to know how willing people are to help with stuff or how willing people are to just get in your car. Like, oh, I know I can just go find a hitchhiker because they need a ride and they think I'm being nice. Yeah, I was reading uh, one of the articles and they mentioned Ed Kemper, who would, mm. who said, who admitted to trying different personalities over time mm. to see if he would joke a little more or be more serious, whether how people would respond once they got wow. in the car. It's, it's, a, I'm surprised actually thinking about him not killing Eileen Hunley right away. He wouldn't kill three people right away. Why wouldn't he, you know? Yeah, maybe he just, just felt intimidated by, 
that many people. I mean, that's a. Oh, lot well, of you know what? Honestly, control. he was he was raised Catholic, and he pretended to be a Catholic, and he was way into the Bible. Oh. So there may have been. I wonder if there was some emotional some sort tug. of church lady aspect. Yeah, yeah. Where he he did have res- some some limited, briefly lasting mm-hmm. respect for her as a person. It was late morning on September fourteenth and student nurse Gwen Burton's blue Ford was parked at Chicago and Lake Streets in Minneapolis. The gosh darn engine wouldn't turn over, so, frustrated, she got out and popped the hood. While she was looking down at the engine, a Chevy Caprice stopped, and Harvey got out wearing mechanic-style green work clothes, like he always did. He asked what's the problem, and after Gwen explained, he said he could fix it, but they'd have to run to his place for some tools. He didn't care that she couldn't pay, and silently shut her hood, rolled up the windows, and led Gwen to his car's passenger side by the elbow. She tried to pull away, but Harvey commanded her to get in, in a way that terrified the 19-year-old. The street was empty of pedestrians, and Harvey forced her into the car, driving southwest out of the city into rural Carver County. The attack matched very closely the attack and rape of Jerry Billings, the forced oral rape, and the hammer forced inside Gwen's vagina, which tore her hymen. He repeatedly choked her unconscious and would slap her across the face when she cried. Gwen asked if he was going to kill her, and Harvey replied that she shouldn't say such things because they might give him ideas. Harvey punched Gwen twice in the stomach, and as she bent over with the wind knocked out of her, he brought his hammer down on her head. Gwen woke up in a gully, soaked in a pool of her own blood. Her hair was matted and dried crisp with it, and her head felt split all the way through. She could not make her body walk, so she dragged herself up the gully and clawed her way out and into a silent alfalfa field. It took her three tries and three and a half hours to achieve her goal. Through the pain and blood, Gwen could see a road far off and began to crawl across the field on her stomach. After a very long time, she reached the side of the road, but was too weak to shout for help as cars and tractors passed by unaware. A few cars did slow for her, though. They would stare, return her wave, and then drive on. As one tractor neared, Gwen called out again, and this time she heard the motor stop and saw a farm boy approaching her on fast feet. She survived, but was partially paralyzed in her right arm and leg for months, had ongoing issues with her memory, and had difficulty speaking when she was tired. She had to drop out of nursing school, and never returned. On September 17th, a body was found in Sherburne County, an area around 42 miles northwest of Minneapolis. The female had been dead a minimum of two weeks, bludgeoned to death with a claw hammer, and, quote, there was a tree branch the killer had jammed into the vagina. On September 18th, Harvey pulled the same 25 bucks to drive the stalled car ruse on Sally Versoy he worked on Lisa King and June Lynch 10 days earlier. She agreed but said they had to take her friend Diana Flynn with, so they picked the 17-year-old up at school, the same work opportunity center where Harvey had picked up students Lisa in June. Harvey drove north to a deserted area, stopped the car, and asked Lisa in June if given a choice, would they rather be raped or killed? Quote, both responded instantly, we'd rather be killed. Harvey registered this with a grunt and drove on. When Diane asked how much further it would be to their destination, Harvey's arm flew like a spring trap, backhanding her in the face, cutting her lip and chipping two of her teeth. When Harvey pulled into a gas station in St. Francis, nearly 40 miles north of Minneapolis, June and Diane were able to escape the vehicle and found safety from Harvey inside the station. Harvey drove off, and the young women reported the incident as soon as they returned to the city. Kathy Schultz, an 18-year-old student at Washburn High School, also took night classes at the Work Opportunity Center in Minneapolis. On the morning of September 20th, she planned to stop by the center to take care of a quick errand. This was the place, probably one of many, which Harvey Kerrigan would cruise outside of like a shark. He had already assaulted, raped, and beaten at least three of the school students. Kathy Schultz's brother was the last of her family to see her, giving her a quick good morning and goodbye, and expecting to see her later that afternoon. When night fell and Kathy had not returned home, her family called all of her friends, but no one had seen her. In a field of tall grass and bundled corn shocks 
50-ish miles north of Minneapolis, in Asante County. Two pheasant hunters froze when they realized the shape at their feet was the body of a woman. It had no face. Blunt object trauma had crushed the features. And its hair was soaked red from all the blood. Quote, her skull was imploded. The body was identified as Kathy Schultz. The body found in Sherburne County back on September 17th was a Caucasian female, badly decomposed. Detectives investigating the attack on Gwen Burton heard from multiple acquaintances about Harvey's girlfriend, Eileen, whom no one had seen in five weeks. After obtaining a search warrant and combing through her home, detectives found no physical evidence of violence and nothing seemed out of place. But among the items they did collect was a dentist bill addressed to Eileen. The Kansas City located dentist was contacted and sent the records on file to the Hennepin County Medical Examiner's Office. Upon comparison, quote, the alignment and dental work were identical. The body was that of Eileen Hunley. There were few discrepancies among the descriptions of Harvey given by the young woman he attacked, like differing estimates regarding his height. But the details that matched did so like a bunch of keys sliding into a bunch of locks. He was terribly strong, always clad in green work clothes, and in the lead-up to each attack, continuously barked threats and obscene language at his captives through camel cigarette smoke. And obviously, all of the survivors' statements had extremely accurate details regarding Harvey's dead eyes and his huge mutton-chop sideburn-framed boogeyman face. The suspect was still unknown to authorities. Detectives from Hennepin County Sheriff's Office, Asante County, and the Minneapolis Police Department conducted a joint meeting regarding the crimes. Comparing cases, they had come to the Detective 101 conclusion that the crimes were related. And there was essentially no physical evidence, except for a plaster cast of a tire tread found in the field where Kathy Schultz's body was found. The room of detectives agreed that their suspect lived in Minneapolis, likely near to the Work Opportunity Center, though they had no idea of Harvey, or that his given address was just over two miles away from the center. A memo containing descriptions of the Green Caprice and the physical description of their unsub was distributed to all patrol officers within 100 miles of Minneapolis. What's an unsub? Uh, unknown subject. Ah. The next day, September 24th, a pair of officers on patrol observed a hideous man in green work clothes walk across a parking lot and climb into a green Chevy Caprice. Harvey was pulled over and asked for ID. The officers noted the interior matched the memo's description, black. Harvey began pouring sweat, and his face, as always, betrayed him and began twitching around his eye and forehead. He was arrested, and his bail was set at $50,000. They pulled him over. They asked him who he was. He matched enough that they took him downtown and started uh, asking him about. So he was simply pulled over. Yeah, the, yeah, the, 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 the bulletin was, was released, and just two random uh, patrol officers just happened to see him and we're like, hmm, he looks exactly mm. like it. He's getting into the exact same car. He was suspicious when they confronted him. And then uh, and then they so they 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 took him down. Jerry Billings was taken to a police garage to identify Kerrigan's pickup. Even though it had been over a year, Jerry peered inside and instantly recognized the black interior, the bucket seats, and the board covering the space between them. The plaster cast of the tire tread matched the make and model of tires listed on a receipt found in Harvey's belongings, dated August 12, 1974. Investigators combing through the warranted locations discovered several maps. The range of the maps spread across the western states, through the Midwest, and north to Canada, covered with nearly 200 areas, marked with red circles. Quote, Some of the circles yielded nothing, indicating points where Harvey had applied for jobs or purchased vehicles, but others seemed to link him with a string of unsolved homicides and other crimes involving women. One such cryptic circle coincided with the discovery of a murdered girl in Medora, North Dakota, in April 1973. Yet another had been drawn around the very intersection in Vancouver where a woman, waiting for the city bus, had been assaulted from behind and beaten with a hammer. There was another marking indicating the Tuolup Reservation where Kathy Miller's body was found, as well as a red circle around Whidbey Island where the body of Laura Brock was discovered in September of 1972. But there were also circles that led down blind alleys, as happened with sheriff's deputies in Yakima County, Washington, 
who investigated the eight red circles covering their area, none of which materialized into a case. It would never be known how many Kerrigan had hurt, raped, and killed, but he was suspected of as many as 180 attacks on women from Seattle to Minneapolis. Lisa King, June Lynch, Diane Flynn, and Sally Versoy identified Harvey Kerrigan in a police lineup. From a bed in ICU, Gwen Burton indicated Harvey's photo among a laydown of 12 mugshots. February 19, 1975, Harvey was tried for the attempted murder and sodomy of Gwen Burton. During the trial, he was described by his jailers as a, quote, model prisoner, a gentleman, in fact, which may have been due to the leg irons and handcuffs with which he was always constrained in court. On February 24th, Gwen Burton, still partially paralyzed from the injuries Harvey inflicted upon her, testified, quote, I was crying the whole time. He told me to shut up. He told me he wanted to see me suffer. When questioned on the stand, Harvey said his reason for trying to kill Gwen was that God told him to, a recurring bit Harvey would often employ to explain away the acts his mind and his hands carried out. His defense attorney, Russell Kruger, later said, quote, He could quote the Bible as good as any minister that I've ever heard, and he once replied to Harvey's vast knowledge of the good book that the devil was also quite capable of quoting scripture. million women are impacted by weakened or thinning hair. Going through it can feel lonely and frustrating. I never expected it to happen to me, but over the past few years, my hair has thinned dramatically. It made me feel sad, overwhelmed, and like part of my identity was gone with the hair I lost. I finally made the decision to do something to help, and that's how I found Nutrafol. Nutrafol supports healthy hair growth from within by targeting the five root causes of thinning, stress, hormones, environment, nutrition, and metabolism through whole body health. It's also the number one dermatologist recommended hair growth supplement, clinically shown to improve your hair growth, thickness, and visible scalp coverage. Nutrafol has three unique formulas to support women throughout all stages of life, including postpartum and menopause. Each formula is physician formulated using natural drug-free medical grade ingredients in consistently effective dosages so you get the most reliable results. In fact, in a clinical study, 86% of women reported improved hair growth after six months. 86%, I'll take those odds. More than 3,000 top doctors and stylists recommend Nutrafol as an effective and high quality solution for healthier hair. Now that all sounds great, but it's always better when you know someone who's tried it and can speak to their experience. I started taking Nutrafol a little over a month ago, and when I got my hair done last week, my stylist noticed that I've had a lot of new hair growth. That's exciting. You can grow thicker, healthier hair and support our show by going to Nutrafol.com and entering the promo code Murder in the Rain to save $15 off your first month subscription. This is their best offer anywhere, and it is only available to U.S. customers for a limited time. Plus, you can get free shipping on every order. Get $15 off at Nutrafol.com, spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L dot com, and enter the promo code Murder in the Rain. In late April 1975, Harvey was tried for the physical assault and sexual abuses inflicted against Jerry Billings. Jerry testified that she hadn't initially reported the crime for weeks because she had run away from home and thought she'd be arrested if she sought help from the police. Gwen, June, Sally, Diane, and Marilis also testified, recalling their nearly deadly run-ins with Carrigan to the court. Harvey was found guilty on all counts in both cases, and he was sentenced to 30 years in each case for his crimes against Jerry Billings and Gwen Burton. On February 9, 1976, Harvey waived his rights in court and admitted he had picked up Kathy Schultz hitchhiking back in September 1974 and then left her body in the field where she was later discovered by hunters. Presiding District Judge Robert Backey asked Kerrigan if a hammer was used in the murder. Harvey said no and described it as similar to a climbing or trenching tool. I think maybe something with a pick end. 
before handing down a 40-year sentence for the murder, Judge Backey addressed Kerrigan. Quote, Your crimes are so gross that there is no point in commenting on them. Kerrigan interrupted at that point and told the judge, Don't comment on them then. Harvey had amassed 100 years of prison time, but the state of Minnesota, by law, would only demand a maximum of 40 years served. Why? And just to make you scream, the sentences would run concurrently and he would be eligible for parole in only 17 years. I literally almost joked and said, oh, wow, I can't believe they gave him a fairly reasonable sentence. Let me guess, they're going to be concurrent? I almost said that as a joke. But I should have known. (sighs) What is this law? Why does it... I'm sorry. What law do you speak of? Why would he only get that amount of time and not the sentence that he was given by a judge for the things that he did? I don't know the law, but there is one. Of course there is. Feeling lucky, Harvey decided to roll the dice and go to trial for the murder of Eileen Hunley. And his gamble paid off. For the state. Hey! Harvey was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison on June 24th, 1976. I love when arrogance bites them in the ass. Harvey appealed, and two years later, the Minnesota Supreme Court said, nah, and upheld the conviction. Oh my God, really? Yep. Oh, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. Be like, oh, actually, another technicality. Kerrigan would die in prison. Ah! Author Anne Rule interviewed Seattle detectives Billy Bauman and Dwayne Homan while doing research for her book, The Wantad Killer, which I highly recommend, and it's available used on thrift books for under five bucks. This is not an advertisement. Detective Homan commented, quote, It's a terrible thing to say, but I almost wish that Harvey had pulled that hammer on us when we went out to tow his car away that day in 1973. If we'd had to kill him then, think of the young woman who would have lived. If it had ended that day, none of the Minnesota crimes would have ever happened. I get what he's saying by that. I mean, I don't condone police violence, but yeah, that'd be great to save those women. But it's also like, maybe you should be more upset with your buddies that didn't do their job right the first time that led to the technicality. And then you wouldn't have to like wish that you shot the guy in a field. And he did say that he doesn't want to, he, he doesn't want to. And he did say that he doesn't ever, he never wanted to shoot anybody ever. Oh, yeah. Just I don't think wish. he's like gun yeah, happy. No, I, I get what he's saying by yeah. that. But it's also like maybe instead of wishing this guy had gone after you, you could wish that like the yeah. thing you worked in was more like properly managed and people followed the law. Uh, just saying. Though the case lay unsolved in police archives, Detective Homan dug through them and pulled out the Kathy Miller case file. He flipped it open and inside wrote January 31st, 1983. This case is closed. Exceptional. The killer of Catherine Sue Miller is presently incarcerated in the Minnesota State Prison. And I'm sorry, which which gal was that? Uh, she was the, the um, in part one, it was Laura Brock was first killed mm-hmm. uh, with the island. And then uh, uh, eight months later, I believe, it was when Catherine Sue Miller, who oh, okay. was 15, she was the one whose books were found in the oh, parking lot. Oh, right, right, right. She was going to meet him outside of the Sears, all that. Oh, yeah. yeah. She was the one doing the job interview. Yes, exactly. Okay. A couple paragraphs ago, I said Harvey Kerrigan would die in prison, but not that he has died. Kerrigan is still alive and remains incarcerated. He is 95 years old and still locked away at the Minnesota Correctional Facility Stillwater in Bayport, Minnesota. He still looks very much the mean old bastard. In a more recent prison mugshot, he has traded out the mutton chops for a biker mustache, but his eyes are the same, cold and reflecting nothing. Wow. That's old for prison. That's old for everyday life. That's like the oldest man on earth as far as prisoners go, I feel. That's, <laughs> That's very in- old. Incredibly Especially old. Especially for how long he's been in prison. And honestly, for how large of a person he is. I feel like gigantic people, like big, big people don't live yeah. forever. But he's fueled by, you know, hate. And I'm, <sighs> and sure, that, I'm sure that he also gets satisfaction from still being alive. Oh, yeah. And for those families that are affected by the by what he did to say that I'm still here and they are still not. It it did. I mean, I know I kind of cheered earlier. That was my initial reaction to hearing that he was going to die behind bars. But yeah, it's 
it my feelings totally changed when you said he's still alive because it's it's like Richard Gilmore, the guy who's being let out in Oregon from Emily's case. He's being released on December 16th. As a level one sex offender. As a level one sex offender. At, at least a three if uh, yeah, released he's, at he's all. He's a violent sexual predator. And so just that thought, even though he's 94, even though he will die behind bars. 95. He, 95, I apologize. So it's like he's already been released before on something. You know, yeah. it's like the possibility of that, of this person. It's. And I have a couple of other things uh, yeah. that I wanted to talk about that I didn't get to. I'm just shocked. I I guess with there being a book about it, it's a well known case. But I don't. I didn't know this case. I don't know this guy. Uh, and you hear so often about oh Craigslist, the Craigslist killer. Can you believe it? And it's like this stuff has been going on since the invention of any kind of public forum, bulletin boards, and newspapers, and Bill Gunnis. Yeah, uh, sending away for husbands. Yeah. yeah. So it's just shocking to not hear, but I don't know if it's that people thought he was less because people survived or something, you know, how we so often hear that. But at the beginning of the episode, I mentioned Harvey getting a speeding ticket in Solano County in California, like uh -huh. the Bay Area. And this was on June 20th, 1973. There's a series of murders called the Santa Rosa Hitchhiker Murders oh. that he was suspected of committing. Oh. Yeah, because he he drove all the time. His first wife, whose name is Sheila, I believe, I think they were married in 1969 and it fell apart very quickly, said that he would often drive at night, all night, come home. And like with, with Eileen in, in uh, Kansas when they were at that home and that body was found, he was, he'd be gone all night and would never explain what it was. Oh, so, so we it's yeah. believed this has been going on a very long yeah, time. Yeah, and police said that he had clocked 200,000 miles on his truck oh, that's right. from 1972 to the time that he was taken. Which is in just just I don't know how you could do it. That's it's a, a lot. lot. So between February 1972 and December 1973, uh, this is a quote here: the bodies of seven girls and young women were found in rural Santa Rosa, buried or dumped along steep embankments or in creek beds. All were found nude. Some had been raped, strangled, or hogtied. So very possible, even probable. That it was him. Yeah, definitely. Uh, at least some of them. I know that there were a couple that didn't match, but there were, yeah, because it was like, yeah, strangling. Uh, one had been poisoned, but they were all dumped in the same way. Hmm. The case, is, it's still unsolved. And the uh, Sonoma County Sheriff's Department, which is, which is the investigating uh, department, has looked into hundreds of suspects. And some of them are very high profile, like Ted Bundy, hmm. Zodiac Killer, and Harvey. Because the ticket that he received, there was one on in June, I think, of 73. It was just mm -hmm. right in the window. And there were eight other tickets I think he received in that window. Uh, but he could never be tied to the crimes. But I was wrapping up the episode this morning, doing a little more research to kind of get a little more clarity on the Hitchhiker murder series. And I found an article from February of this year. There was a DNA match to CODIS, you know, the FBI database of uh, mm -hmm. whatever, DNA samples. Uh, and there was a match to a uh, a man named Jack Boken, and it was connected to the murder of a woman named Michelle Veal in Union City, California. Uh, it happened in 1996. Oh. And it, and it, they never solved it. It, it. it it laid cold for a long time. But there was a new detective who joined the Violent Crimes Investigation Unit, which covered these cold cases. And he was just going through one of the cases. He just wanted to just kind of crack open a cold case and look at it and see what he could do. Right. And it happened to be Michelle Veals. And they found a uh, a scraping that was never tested of uh, Michelle Veals' hand that had that might have had DNA. So like a, oh, yeah, so like a nail a scraping. Nail, yeah. yeah. So they tested it. Comes back to this guy named Jack Boken, who is already in prison, and he actually died in 2021 from from pneumonia. He was 78. Mm. Uh, and he was in prison serving a 231-year sentence for convictions on 19 felony counts from October of 2000 for kidnapping and sexually assaulting three women and for trying to murder one of them. Wow. This is a quote here. Jack Boken was not just a San Francisco serial rapist. He held these women in the basement of homes while his family was at home and was striking these women on the back of the head with a hammer. So they matched. So those killings, the Santa Rosa hitchhiker murders. Oh, they, 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 were similar. And also Michelle Veal's body, I don't know if I said that, was was also dumped on the side of the road. Also, uh, looking into his background, they found that this uh, Jack Boken's parents 
had a home near Santa Rosa during the time of those murders. Wow. I know that now that they've had that match and that now that, that those crimes have uh, those similarities, they're going back and they're looking at all of them all over again. Hmm. Um, and there may be, yeah. So I, what, what I think is that there's just, there's those murders and probably many, many others that just overlap between, I mean, at least Definitely. those two and probably more like 20 yeah. serial killers or something like that. Yeah. I'm hoping there's an update. I'm hoping they can at least uh, close the case uh, on that one, you know, or at least yeah. tie him definitively, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, nice. he died. He died of, of pneumonia last year. So, Well, one less monster. At least he's dead. So in all, how many victims, either surviving or not, do they think Harvey had? They said, you know, as many as 180. That's 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 the big number, and it may I mean it may even be more. I mean, it, it, a man like that could run unchecked and do. He could have killed someone literally every night of his life for mm-hmm. years, and no one would have ever noticed. Yeah, because he was he was well. I mean, except for the sweating and twitching and looking the way he did, he uh, was pretty good at holding it together. Yeah, and he was successful. His gas station sold the most gas in town. Oh, and he's a local businessman. He's not. What do you? He's a little he rough around be. the edges. He gets a little angry. He'll yeah. pick up a truck and slam it down on the ground somehow. But he's not gonna. Yeah. Well, I look forward to the day you can tell us that he is no longer amongst us. Thank you. There was another tangent. A quick oh, one. yes. So when Harvey was on trial, I think the first trial he went to, which was the, uh, I think the Gwen Burton attack. I'm not sure exactly. Maybe mm-hmm. Jerry Billings. In the middle of all of that, the trial and everything, there was a um, an unidentified woman called into the FBI to talk about a sketch she'd seen uh, on an FBI bulletin regarding a kidnapping. And it was the kidnapping of, uh, this is in Minneapolis, of a woman named Virginia Piper who was married to an investment banker who was very well known. One day, two masked men broke into the house. They were going to steal their son or kidnap their son, Bobby, but instead she was home, so they took Virginia and then sent a ransom letter to the husband, Harry, for a million dollars. He paid it. And then two days later, they received a call telling them where to, where to get her. And they went to the state park. And she was there tied to a tree. I'm sorry, chained to a tree. But she was alive. She wasn't hurt. She was just wet and cold and hungry. Wow. You don't often hear about that. Ever. Out. Which, yeah, the first, that was the first part of the story that was really, really novel. Is that they, they didn't kill her. So the sketch the woman saw was of uh, one of a possibility for one of the two kidnappers of Virginia Piper, mm. and that person looked like someone that was associated with Harvey Kerrigan. Oh, so and then in their investigation, police found that he had he has two brothers, two half brothers, Clint and Bernard, I believe, who I'm imagining might be the person that that woman saw. Oh, um, because. I'm just guessing they kind of have a similar look to them. Right. And so that identification led to them finding Harvey. So the woman was kidnapped and then they had a sketch of, did she? This wasn't the woman that was kidnapped that oh. said it. So it was some some woman saw this sketch in this bulletin. I de- thought it looked like someone, a friend of Harvey Kerrigan's or, oh. or maybe his brother, contacted the FBI. The FBI investigate Harvey and they're like, hey, the FBI assembled a voice lineup. And took it to Virginia Piper. They play it for her. And they're like, and she's like, that is one of the guys that kidnapped me. And so the FBI talks to Kerrigan and he he denies it. And as far as the ransom goes, a million was collected by the kidnappers, but only uh, twice were they used. Uh, was any of the money used. So it was in 1972 and 1974 in Minneapolis and just outside of Minneapolis, money was passed just like in a store or whatever. Huh. And, and then found by the FBI. But after that, it never happened again. Well, Harvey Kerrigan was in prison from 1974 <laughs> till today. Oh, and I, so if he had that money, it's just sitting somewhere. I think it's just stashed, sitting somewhere. And buried, I, hidden. Because I don't think he'd be like, hey, half-brother, here's this money. I don't think he would do that. Right. Oh, and the uh, the state park where they found Virginia Piper tied up to the tree mm-hmm. was across the road from a farm in uh, near Duluth where Harvey lived as a kid for a brief time. Oh, my gosh. Um, I know that's all circumstantial, but when, like, 
all of these crime scenes are within like oh. a couple of miles <laughs> of you. Like, And the last part of it was that the, the 20s that were used in these two parts. Of oh, the, uh-huh. in your, so it was one in uh, southern Minnesota and then another in Brooklyn Park, which is near Minneapolis. Uh, there was there were maps, some of the maps that they found of Harvey with the red circles. Right. There were two two circles that matched on a Minnesota map to Where those to those spots. Yeah. <sighs> so it was. I don't know if it was if it was exact location or just the the area. Right. But again, it's like another. Wow. There's so many links, but and this is all in the middle of his his trial for <laughs> for the other crimes that he committed. Right. And it was like a quick tangent of only like a couple of days, but it was yeah. It's just it's just wow. strange that his. His presence was felt in other places like that. That he, he may have had a vast uh, criminal career. I know that he went to prison with his uh, brother. I think for 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 robbery and right. theft and things like that. So. Yeah, his he, his M O is scary because there is one, but there also is a variety of them. Yeah. So it's it's like whatever he feels like doing that day. Yeah, and he was and he loved all types of crime. Wow. Yeah. Good so. riddance. So that was the other tangent, and that's really it. Yeah, it was. Uh, uh, was it, it was. I worked on this for a long time. I started it bef- in August before I had my surgery, and that's I right. just finished it this morning. You started it with your old heart, finished it with the new. It's just the wrong texture for that area. <laughs> Hi, everybody. This is Josh. You Hello. hesitated. It's going to get cold. Won't yeah, it well. yeah. Yeah, we all. <laughs> you, know. Yeah, you do know it. <laughs> well, the weather outside Six. is unchanging. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite deranging. Oh. Sell my furniture. I'm rearranging. What? Brian Williams style. Oh. Ooh. He watched his daughter get her butt eaten out. I watched his daughter get her butt <laughs> eaten out a couple times. <laughs> Thanks, we Brian. We talked about that pre- like in an interview or something, and I hated it. That's, that's my kind of tangent right there. We touched on so many things <laughs> at once. <laughs> it was fantastic. We're pop culture... Uh, mm, Knowers, <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> unless it's popular music. Or, Welcome to our or new TikTok. our new podcast, the Pop Culture Knowers. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, comma sometimes. Hey guys, Emily isn't here today, so it's just us elderly folks that aren't on TikTok. We watched some sort of music award and didn't know anyone. How about that Jack Harlow with that chicken that chicken meal? A very important announcement to make. <laughs> I'm a fool. <clears throat> my little, little, my little dummy. stupid eyes won't do it. <laughs> my little stupid brain won't read them. My little mouth won't <laughs> form the words. <laughs> Filed the report with the Goodhue County Sheriff's Office. Goodhue County Sheriff's Office. I did. I did. No, you didn't. <laughs> You've never sounded like that. <laughs> Too spicy. <laughs> Cut it out. <laughs> Uncle Joey style. In a theater. What? Dave Coulier. In oh. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a second to connect those dots. I counted them. But then I remembered the cross-eyed bear. <laughs> In a theater. <laughs> I'm like, there's no way Dave Coulier has ever performed in a theater. <laughs> He and did then, it in, in a way. He yeah. did. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> and not the <theater. laughs> Oh no, we've lost it. <laughs> no, it's good. I have I have energy now. I'm like laugh. I'm able to laugh again. <laughs> oh, I can laugh again. I can smell again. I can fart again. <laughs> in a theater. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that was a jagged little pill. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Thicke dated a teenager. Of course he did. Christy Swanson, I believe. Christy Swanson, you say. And she was like. That's right. She was super young. Or 15 That's or right. Something. Buffy herself. 
the real Buffy. She is piano. my Buffy. I saw that in the goddamn theater with my mommy. <laughs> and it was great. <laughs> Anne Rice was pissed originally when Tom Cruise was cast because she wanted Rutger Hauer. That would have been horrible. Rutger Hauer and Cher or Brad Pitt. The original cast of <laughs> Interview of the Vampire is Rutger Hauer and Cher. Yeah. Wow. Fun fact. That would have been really bad. I've got legs. <laughs> And they end in weird feet. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. Did you throw up a little bit? A little bit. Oh. That was my peanut butter and jelly and mocha. Ooh. So it wasn't the worst thing in the world, but I wouldn't want a cup of it. (laughs) 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 Oh, no. (laughs) <laughs> All that's right. like the i wouldn't kick it out of bed for yeah for i wouldn't i wouldn't want a cup of it yeah <laughs> i wouldn't kick it out of bed for throwing up in my mouth <laughs> oh shit piper parabo okay so now uh, uh i don't know what i said murder in the rain is a cascade media production Written and hosted by Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough. Edited by Josh McCullough. You can always contact us at murderintherain at gmail.com or through our website, murderintherain.com. If you just can't get enough of Murder in the Rain, for as little as $5 a month, you'll have exclusive access to bonus episodes at patreon.com. You can find us on all of the socials, and for more true crime, follow at M underscore Murder in the Rain on TikTok, and you can also listen to Alicia and Josh on their other show, Always Be My Sisters. And suck my balls. <laughs> <laughs>